All right, here we are, Daniel Revelation, uh, lesson number three. So please take out your Bibles uh, to Daniel. We'll, re we'll be reading a couple of, a couple of passages here. Uh, and as I mentioned in the last uh, couple of lessons, we are reviewing the book of Daniel in preparation for our study of the book of Revelation. Uh, again, as a reminder, uh, this is the outline that I gave you last time for the, uh, for the book, and I want to go over it again, put a little more detail into it this time. Book of Daniel really broken into four pieces, four parts. Part one, um, he talks about the court of the king Nebuchadnezzar, chapter one, verse one to 21. Uh, and we know the story, it's a familiar one. These uh, young uh, Jewish uh, boys or men, Daniel and his three friends, are in captivity and part of Babylonian captivity, for them anyways, was to train them in Babylonian literature and politics and so on and so forth. Uh, they are also placed in a high position. And so uh, Daniel talks about that in chapter one. Chapter two uh, is Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And in Nebuchadnezzar's uh, dream, he sees this great statue uh, with the head of gold, uh, silver um, arms, uh, brass and um, hips, and of course, uh, legs of silver, uh, not silver, but iron mixed with uh, um, clay for the feet. Uh, and he has this dream and he sees a, a, a rock that is formed, or stone that is formed without hands, all of a sudden appearing and striking that statue on its feet and the statue disintegrates and is blown away and disappears. Uh, and we know in this particular story that Daniel comes forward to discern the dream and he interprets it, and from historical records we know that he was correct in his interpretation. He tells the king that the statue represents kingdoms that are to come. And so the head, of course, is the present kingdom of Babylon, the head of gold, the silver chest and arms, the Medo Persian Empire, which followed the Babylonian one, the brass belly and hips were the Greeks. The Greeks are the ones that overcame uh, the Medo-Persian Empire, and then the iron legs and feet mixed with iron and clay were the Romans. The stone was Christ and His church that appeared during the Roman period. Now, now Daniel doesn't give all this detail. He simply gives you know, the stone, hits the base of the statue and so on and so forth. But we know from history that that stone was the imagery of Christ and His church that appeared during the Roman period and eventually grew to cover the earth while all the kingdoms before it were crushed and have disappeared from world uh, power. No more Babylonian empire, never regained its strength, no more Medo-Persian empire, no more Greek empire, no more Roman empire. And so for a couple of thousand years, these uh, great kingdoms uh, have remained, uh, you know, have remained uh, dormant, if you wish, uh, and have disappeared from of the historical scene. So from this point on, Daniel and his three friends are given a high position uh, because the king recognizes Daniel's uh, great gift of being able to, um, uh, to interpret dreams and visions. So that was the second part of the, the book. The third part describes the four episodes in Daniel's life, chapter three, verse one, all the way to chapter six, verse 28, and we're going to talk about that tonight, so I'm not going to spend any time there. And then the fourth part are the four visions of Daniel's prophecy, chapter seven to 12. Uh, the four visions uh, in Daniel's prophecy are just simply more detailed visions concerning the earlier prophecy regarding the world powers that were to come in the future. And one mistake that a lot of people make is they see the visions and the prophecy and they think that they're different things. And they're not different things, they're just four different ways of seeing the same, the same thing. But for now, let's look at Nebuchadnezzar's reaction to Daniel's interpretation of his, uh, of his dream. Now, the four important events uh, that begin in chapter three cover a period of about 60 years and the majority of Daniel's record. The way he writes them, you would think they happen one after another, but it, it does cover a long period of time. 
We're going to review all four of those in, in our lesson tonight. As I said, we're not going to read all of the book. This is a survey. You know, we're getting a bird's eye view of this material, so we have to work a little more quickly. So the first event, first episode, is The Fiery Furnace, chapter three. Now according to the Septuagint, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. There was a time when um, the Greek uh, culture uh, was very prominent and uh, many Jews were not able to speak Hebrew, but they could speak Greek because it became the language, uh, if you wish, of the, of the nations. And so as to not lose uh, the value of the scriptures, uh, 70 scholars were appointed to translate the Hebrew, what we would call the Old Testament, to translate the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, into the modern language uh, of the times. And that particular translation uh, is called the Septuagint. Um, so according to the Septuagint, this event, the fiery furnace, took place in the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign after Daniel had been in Babylon about the same amount of time, 18 years. Uh, this was the same year that Nebuchadnezzar uh, returned to Jerusalem a second time in order to burn it down and to destroy the temple. Um, it's interesting that Daniel does not appear in this. He writes about it, but he himself does not appear. So let's read just a small portion of this, beginning in chapter three, verse uh, one. It says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits, and it's width six cubits, he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the uh, satraps, the prefects and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, to you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up but whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, at that time, when all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Now, some people claim that Nebuchadnezzar got this idea from the statue that he saw uh, in his dream. You know, the, the, the making uh, um, and the refurbishing of public shrines and altars and statues was actually part of the king's duty. The king is the one that kind of you know, repaired the temples and put up the statues and the shrines. That was the role of the king. So the king uh, establishes a new shrine, if you wish, one uh, that will give honor to himself. Uh, Dura is an unknown site in the um, Babylonian Flat River area. Uh, some archaeologists have found some very large pedestals that could have been the base of this particular statue. Now the idea was to put it in the flatland so it could be seen from afar. You, know, you put it in a flatland, you, boy, that statue was nine feet across and 90 feet high. So it's a pretty high statue. And so uh, 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 you know, if it's in a flat plain, you can see the statue and the sun shining off that thing from, uh, from pretty, far, pretty far away. So the king was to use the unveiling of the statue. Uh, he wasn't trying to start like a new religion or anything. I mean, for him it was an opportunity to test the loyalty and the submissiveness of his court and his ministers. He calls and tells them to bow down and they do. And what that proves is that he's in charge. You know, he made a statue, you don't, you don't see him mentioning there's a new God, a new theology, a new, no, no, no. The whole idea was when I tell you to bow down, 
you're going to bow down and this is the statue you're going to bow down in front of. Of course, this presents a problem for the three friends of Daniel because like the pagan food, this was a violation of their faith. Now to do this, even just to appease the king, was to sin against God. You can imagine what went through their brain. I mean, what could it hurt? You know, I know in my own mind and in my own heart, I don't really, you know, I don't really believe this statue. It's just a statue. You know. But this was not their thinking. Their thinking was they would not in any way, shape or form um, practice any kind of idolatry, even if it was just to, you know, to appease uh, the king. So Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego refused to do this and their detractors, others jealous of their position, accused these men of insubordination to the king. Funny how uh, human nature is the same. This happened you know, thousands of years ago and yet what was driving this? They were jealous that these foreigners had these high positions in the kingdom and they saw an opportunity to take them down, and they did. Somehow that sounds very familiar. You know, I think that same scenario plays itself over and over again in schools, colleges, corporations. You know, we, sometimes we don't like other people uh, getting ahead of us. And so the king, of course, is furious uh, that they have not obeyed his command um, because they've also served him well. And in, if we read the whole chapter, he gives them a chance to explain themselves. And that's significant because, I mean, anybody else would have just been you know, executed. But because these men were particularly important to him, they served him well, he at least gives them a chance to explain themselves. And these faithful men, what do they tell the king? Well, they tell the king that their confidence is in God to save them. And whether he does so or not doesn't really matter they're not going to do this. I mean, I think that's pretty courageous to stand up to power and say, you know what? I know that God has the power to save me if He wants to. But you know what? Whether He saves me or not, I'm not going to do this thing. I'm not going to disobey in this way. Pretty courageous stuff. And so the king demands that they be thrown into a large brick kiln oven, heated to the max, which would have, uh, you know, which would leave, uh, actually, would, which, which would leave no ashes whatsoever. They'd be burned to a powder. And of course, uh, this was an abomination, even for pagans, not to leave anything behind. So the king observes that the three are joined by a fourth person and that the fire is not affecting them at all. And we know from that story, I'm going to try, I had a, there we go. We know from you know, our, our Bible teaching, we know when we read the story, uh, that this is the angel of the Lord. Very interesting. Uh, you know, I read a book recently all about angels and uh, the author was, had a lot to say about the angel of the Lord. Some think it's an angel, especially a high ranking angel, if you wish, because there's hierarchy among angels. Another opinion is that it's a, um, a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Jesus. In other words, Jesus in the form of an angel appearing to man. So there's always been some speculation about that. An interesting study, but not the one we're, we're doing here tonight. The important thing is there was a fourth being in with the three men. And when they're released, unharmed, Nebuchadnezzar decrees that the religion of these men become a protected religion and he rewards the three with even higher positions. So the guys who were trying to sabotage them, their plot backfired on them. Now there's some good lessons from this particular episode, one of which is uh, whether God heals us or not, whether God answers our prayers or not, whether God gives us prosperity or not, He is still, He's still God and He deserves our trust and our obedience. Our obedience to God is not based on if He's going to do what we ask Him to do for us or not. You know, okay, if, if you give me what I want and I'll make a special effort at obeying you. That's not how it works. We make an effort to obey God simply because He's God and we're not. Another uh, good lesson here is that you will have your chance to witness for Christ sooner or later. Everybody gets an opportunity to publicly show their faith, 
even if it's not as dramatic as this. Not many of us will be you know, tortured to death for our faith. Not many will be thrown into a fiery furnace. But we all have you know, opportunities to share our faith, to stand up for Christ. Uh, we all have uh, opportunities to do this sometimes when it may be embarrassing or challenging or put us in a kind of an awkward uh, position. So it's not always life or death, but it's always a test to confess Christ or to deny Christ. Always a, always a difficult test. I'll tell you, you, know, you, uh, you know, we, I think most of us here have the uh, the good habit of giving thanks before we eat. It's something that we do. I, certainly we do that at our house. You know? And um, uh, I think it's a good thing. Uh, God provides the food. We say thank you and, and we ask Him to bless uh, the food and so on and so forth. And, and if you go to somebody's house you know, and they're Christians, just more people you know, doing that. Even if you go have a burger at McDonald's, you, know, you, you kind of bow your head and you, you give thanks. But I remember once we went, Lisa and I went to eat at the Vast, you know, up at the, in the Devon Tower, you know, up on the 50th floor, fancy schmancy restaurant, you know, all the waiters you know, with towels and little music, you know, $50 for a raw egg, you know what I'm saying? They're really kind of a fancy place. You know? And then it, it came time, you know, the, the entree were in front of us, and we figured, well, let's, let's give thanks now. And the waiter, the snooty waiter, was kind of hovering, you know? and just for a moment I had a little hesitation, you know, thinking, well, he must think we're just you know, real folks. You know, here we are in this fancy restaurant and we're making this guy wait before he serves us the butter, you know what I'm saying? Because we want to give thanks, but you know, it's like, hey, <laughs> this is your witness. Who knows about this snooty waiter? Maybe that'll have an impact on him. But anyways, whether you're at the Vast or you're at the, the McDonald's, you always, you always get a chance to witness your faith one way or another. Okay, so, uh, and, and then another lesson here is that God is always with you, even if it seems that He's let you down. You know, the angel was a sign that God would be with these men in death, even if this time He was sparing them for his own purposes. Again, in that book that I was reading about angels, this author, a member of the church uh, who wrote quite an exhaustive study of angels, uh, was showing various scriptures, you know, uh, demonstrating the idea that perhaps it's angels that carry us from here to where we're going to be. You know, very interesting idea, especially based and when you see what's going on here. All right, episode number two. So that's episode number one. Second episode, in Daniel's life is Nebuchadnezzar's madness, chapter four. Now in this chapter, Nebuchadnezzar recounts the events of his madness and recovery. So it's you know, Nebuchadnezzar telling the story. He has a dream where a great tree is present and ultimately cut down to a stump. And Daniel tells him that the tree represents him and that because of his pride, his sanity will be taken from him and he will have the mind of an animal for seven periods. Now, uh, there's a term for what he had. It's called uh, lycanthropy. It's a form of schizophrenia. An individual begins to act out like an animal of some kind. Now, Babylonians counted only summer and winter. For Babylonians, there was no spring or fall. It was summertime or it was wintertime. So this would be uh, the seven periods would be a length of time of about three, a little over three years. So Daniel also appeals to the king to repent of his sins and to do good deeds to avoid the punishment from God. Now if we read the chapter we find out that the king does not repent and a year later as he's walking on the roof of his palace contemplating his own achievements and how great he is, you know, look at all this, I did all of this, he's suddenly struck with this madness. Now the Babylonians believe that madness was a form of divine madness. In other words, it was the gods that were working inside the individual. Because if you're thinking, hey, this is a pagan king in a pagan land, everybody's you know, rooting for power. You know, if the king is mad, you know, why not just you know, get rid of him and take over? Well, no. Uh, as a matter of fact, they had a lot of motivation to keep him alive and to, to care for him in his madness. There are actually some inscriptions by Nebuchadnezzar 
that have been found by archaeologists, thousands of large bricks that tell of all of his great victories and his great works, and uh, these bricks were used as building bricks for a lot of the monuments and a lot of the um, structures in Babylon. Well, what's interesting is one of his writings mentions a period of four years where he did no public works and where he did not delight in his kingdom, a kind of a passing reference to this episode, which is explained in detail in the book of Daniel. So with time, he recognizes his sin and he acknowledges that God is the true ruler of the world and this includes the ruler of kings. And after this realization and confession, he's restored to health, to his position, and also to his splendor. Now, an interesting thing about this, uh, this episode is to trace the progression of Nebuchadnezzar's, Nebuchadnezzar's faith beginning with a fierce pagan and proud ruler. That's where he, that's where he starts. And so after uh, Daniel interprets his original dream, he acknowledges that God is stronger than all the gods. So he's still a polytheist who has added the Lord to his list of gods. That's when Daniel does his first interpretation. Wow, your God's pretty powerful. We got all these other gods that they have power, but your God is really powerful. So he adds God, Jehovah, you know, to all his other gods. That's his first step of faith. Well, after the furnace, he declared, you know, where the, the men are put in to be burned and they don't burn and he sees the fourth man. So after the furnace episode, he declares that worship to this powerful God is a good thing and it should be protected. So now he's a sympathetic polytheist. He's still a polytheist, but now he's sympathetic. You know what? This, this, this God that was better than all the other gods, if you're going to choose a God, this one, this is the one you ought to be praying to because he has a lot of power, this God. And then after the second dream and his recovery from madness, he himself now worships God and declares him to be eternal, all-powerful and sovereign. In other words, he actually prophesies himself and he now is a believer in the God of Daniel and the God of uh, the other young uh, Jews. So it's a good lesson for us who are sometimes you know, discouraged about converting our family or our friends or the effect of the gospel on power, powerful people. Look at the effect of you know, Daniel's ministry in his kingdom. This, this proud pagan king you know, goes from being a proud pagan king to one who declares that only God is God. That's uh, a pretty long spiritual journey. All right, episode number three. Episode number three is Belshazzar's Feast. That's chapter five. Again, I keep reminding you, we're not doing line by line, we're just summarizing this book, okay, in order to prepare us for the book of Revelation. So now in Daniel's book, we fast forward to the very last night of the Babylonian kingdom. Daniel has now been in Babylon for about 70 years years. Again, we read his book, we think things happen a couple of months, you know, uh, you know, just over a period of a couple of months, but his stories, they cover his entire life. A lot of stuff went on between these events. So by this time, Nebuchadnezzar is dead and a man named Nabonidus has inherited the rulership. But since he would prefer other pursuits, he leaves the throne in the hands of Belshazzar his son. This Belshazzar decides to organize a lavish feast in his own honor and as the food and the, especially the wine is flowing, he demands that the vessels that were taken from the temple in Jerusalem be brought out for display and common usage for the party. They're saying, he says, hey, you know what would be fun? You know what would be cool? If we went into our treasury and you know those gold cups and those saucers and all that, those things that we took out of the temple at Jerusalem, wouldn't it be great if we used that to serve the bread and the meat and, and to you know, fill our wine jugs with and so on and so on? I think that's a really neat idea. Well, this of course was a sacrilege to Jewish eyes 
and all done out of pride and with the purpose of showing how powerful they were, having destroyed the temple of the Jews, they're thinking that we destroyed the temple, therefore we destroyed their God. Because in those days, if you defeated a country, it meant your God was stronger than their God. So you took their God's idols and stuff and you brought them into your temple and they were like trophies. And so, okay, there's the God of the Ammonites and there's the God of the, the, you know, the parasites and there's the God of the, you know, whatever. Uh, and we defeated all of these people. So this was, this, this was the mindset of Belshazzar. Well, while this is going on, a man's hand appears and begins to write on the wall opposite them. So this really frightened the king. And so he called on his wise men to interpret the writing on the wall, promising them the third highest position in the kingdom for the one who could do it. Now, the reason he gives the third highest position is because his father has the highest position, he's the king, and then he has the second position, and then he would give the third position to whoever could you know, uh, decipher the writing. Well, no one can do it, and finally Daniel is brought in to make uh, or to solve the mystery. So uh, Daniel refuses the reward, but he interprets the message. But before he does, he reminds Belshazzar of Nebuchadnezzar's experiences with God and the lessons that Nebuchadnezzar learned. Lessons which Belshazzar has refused to learn and which have brought him to this point. And so the inscription the inscription was a series of symbols for Aramaic weights and measures. A minna, a minna, a shekel, and fractions. All right? And so let's look at the word, interpret, uh, the word interpretation. Uh, the word interpretation is this, numbered because minnas were counted in units. They were numbered. One, two, three, four. That's how you counted minnas. Um, shekels were measured by weight. Okay, they weren't counted, they were measured by weight. And fractions represented division. And so the literal interpretation of what was on the wall was the following. God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. God has weighed you in the balance and you have been found wanting. And then finally, your kingdom will be divided, and of course, we know, given to the Medes and the Persians. So of course, Belshazzar is pretty disturbed by this, uh, and yet he still offers the honor to Daniel and declares him to be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now, inscriptions found again by archeologists tell us that this took place precisely on October the 12th, 539 BC. That night, the Medes, led by Darius, and Darius was one of Cyrus, it was King Cyrus that was eventually over the kingdom, but Cyrus was fighting a war north of that nation, and so Darius, one of his commanders, diverted the flow of the Euphrates River that flowed through the, the, the city. Remember last time I told you that Babylon, the, uh, the city of Babylon was surrounded by 15, you know, 60 miles of walls, 50 feet thick, 30 feet high. You, you know, they went into the ground 15, 20 feet. You couldn't dig under them. You couldn't get over them. They had sentries everywhere. And so what the Medes did is they, they cut off the water coming into the city. And once they diverted the water, what appeared? Well, the, 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 the riverbed. The riverbed led underneath the wall. And so they captured two Babylonian deserters and the two Babylonian deserters led them under the wall in the dry riverbed into the city and they captured the city without a single battle while the king and the leaders were drunk at their feast. Now Darius reigned for about two years while Cyrus was fighting other battles, but eventually Cyrus came to claim the rulership in Babylon. That's why sometimes you hear Darius the king or Cyrus the king, what's going on? Well, that's, that's what was going on at that time. Now, another good lesson when you, uh, when you look at this uh, episode is that 
We should be careful to learn from the mistakes of the past. Boy, that's not a new lesson. What do they say? If, if, if you don't know your history, you're bound to repeat it. Same idea, Belshazzar was defeated because he refused to honor God or apply any of the lessons that uh, he had learned from the past uh, in, the present, um, in the present kingdom for his present rulership. Okay, fourth episode, fourth episode. Fourth episode, Daniel in the lion's den. That'll be chapter, chapter six. So Daniel, perhaps because he had prophesied concerning the, the victory of the Medes and the Persians, is now placed with two others into the cabinet position over 120 governors who would rule over the entire nation. He keeps saying, I, I don't want any honors, I don't want any position, and yet he keeps going up and up and up and up, even the new king puts him in a high, uh, you know, they reorganize the kingdom into provinces and the new king puts him into a very high position. And of course, the people who are there, same problem, jealousy, they want him out. And so they devise a plan to attack him on his religious beliefs and practices which are different than their own. Now we're not talking about Babylonians, now we're talking about the Persians, the Medes and the Persians. So their strategy was to create a law which in effect made the king the supreme high priest for a month. Like you become the honorary high priest for the month of March, you know, something like that. That was the plan. And of course the idea behind it, the way that they kind of you know, uh, um, uh, talked the king into it, if you wish, sold the king on the plan, is that this would show his authority in every dimension because no prayer, no petition, no religious function could be performed without his blessing for a certain period of time. So it was all about power, it was all about the demonstration of power. With his army, he could demonstrate he had power over men, over their lives. Being a priest, a high priest, showed that he also had power over men's spiritual lives. Okay? So, but it was, all about, it was all about power. Now the plot was to accuse Daniel of defying this law through his daily habit of private prayer. The law was punishable by death, and under Persian custom, royal decrees could not be changed, nor could exceptions be made. Of course, Daniel is once again faced with the decision of honoring God or forfeiting his position and his life. The lions, of course, when they talk about the lions, the lions were kept by Persian kings for sport. They would, uh, they would hunt and kill them on royal land to demonstrate their sovereignty over man and over beast. And so the king, you know, he's over man with his armies. He keeps lions as pets to show that he's also, maybe the lion is king of the jungle, but the king is king of beasts as well. And now he's also the high priest, you know, total dominance, total, total power. And so now Daniel, who is now about 90 years old, contrary to pictures in Sunday school, a lot of times you see pictures of Daniel and he's just a boy, but this is happening at the end of his life, so he's maybe 80, 90 years old at this time. He's placed in the den, and of course we know he's unharmed. This pleases the king because he respected Daniel and realized that the plot, I mean he realized the plot too late, and so he couldn't change his decree. He was happy that Daniel uh, was safe. After Daniel is removed from the den, the ministers and the governors who participated in the plot are executed along with their families. Pretty ruthless stuff. As the chapter ends, uh, it ends with Darius glorifying God and rewarding Daniel like Nebuchadnezzar had rewarded him uh, in his lifetime. And so we've reviewed four episodes in Daniel's life that showed his and his friends faith and courage, God rescuing them um, over and over again, and pagans, pagan kings brought to faith or punished by a king who was demonstrated as being much greater than, than they. Now, all of this happened to affect certain uh, people. 
For example, Daniel and his friends were vindicated by their faith in God. So all these episodes uh, resulted in certain, uh, in certain things. Uh, for Daniel and, and his friends, uh, they demonstrated that their faith was sincere in God and God would take care of them. Uh, the kings and the leaders in Babylon came to know and honor the true God who raises up kings and kingdoms and has the power to destroy them and destroy their, their idols. And of course, the Jews who were in Babylonian captivity, I mean, think about them for a second. They saw their city and their temple where God dwelled, destroyed and overrun by pagans. They had to put up with the boast of their captors that the power of their God was not any greater than the power of the pagan gods. They had to put up with that kind of uh, taunting, uh, that kind of derision. And their captivity and destruction of Jerusalem was pretty, uh, you know, it was pretty convincing proof. You know, when they're saying to you, wait a minute, I thought your God was the great God. I thought your God was the God that led you out of Israel. I thought your God was the great God that did all these miracles. Where is he now? You know, your city's in ruins and you are captive in our nation. Where is, where is your God? And I think that that echoes throughout the centuries, even to today. Sometimes we feel kind of small, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes we feel kind of powerless in our society. We don't have a very high platform from which we can speak. We watch, I don't know about you guys, but I watch the news sometimes and I'm talking back to the TV and thinking, come on, how can this be? How can this happen? Who's running the show? You know what I'm saying? I'm seeing some of you going, amen. You know? And you're thinking, how, how do some of these people get to a place where they can spout off these insane ideas to millions of people and we who have the words of life can barely you know, get it out the, the door. We're so small, we're so weak in comparison to the evil one in the world. And yet this story of Daniel demonstrates that God doesn't need us to demonstrate His power. He doesn't need us to be powerful in order to demonstrate His existence and His power. He can, as we've said before, He can raise up empires and He can bring them down, as we have seen even in our own, even in our own lifetime. So they had to put up with all of this and I'm saying we have to put up with it to a certain extent as well. However, through Daniel's life, and the very high profile events that I've just described, God was able to help His people maintain faith that despite their defeat, God was still in charge and still working in their lives as well as in the lives of their captors. And that's the idea. It's not about winning. It's not about whether we win or not. It's about whether we remain faithful or not. That's the key. Sometimes we're overwhelmed with the burden of sorrow or difficulty, our life is difficult, problems in our families, health issues. You know, look at Brother Harold read all those cards. That was just from tonight. Look at all the different illnesses and problems that people have that we're praying. And the challenge for us is to remain faithful despite the evidence around us that somebody else other than God seems to be controlling our country and our society. And this story, I think, speaks to us today. No matter what was happening, Daniel knew exactly what his task was. Somebody asked me when I was you know, teaching a course recently in Canada, somebody asked me, well, what would you do you know, if, if, uh, if the, the Chinese uh, nation, the great the, you know, Chinese took over North America? I said, well, I'd keep on preaching the gospel. Well, what would you do if there was a nuclear war and half the country was wiped out? I said, well, if I survive, I'd be preaching the gospel. And then I added, and you know what? If I lived somehow another 200 years and they, and they had colonies on Mars and Pluto and, and other stars and they had people living on all those stars, you know what I would do? I would preach the gospel. 
because I know what my task is. My task is not to win, not to end up with the most toys, not to have the most money. That's not my task. My task is to preach the gospel, to proclaim the word. How rich I am, how not rich I am, that's neither here nor there. I'll only be here a few years and then I'll be gone. The important thing is, for me, is that I remain faithful. The important thing for you is that you remain faithful. And remember, the exercise that we're going through tonight, this hour or two that we spend together in fellowship and prayer and worship, in teaching and sharing the word, all of it is simply to bolster our strength and our faith so that we can remain faithful in a world that is not faithful. And I think that's what Daniel, especially these episodes, teach us. Okay, next time we're going to move along uh, into the next section of uh, Daniel. We've got to leave ourselves time to actually get into the book of Revelation, but we will. Thank you very much for your attention.